Hi, Clay Daniel here. This is an intro to LSAT Logic Games video. I find that it's best to dive right in and talk about the nature of LSAT Logic Games with a particular game in mind. So out of respect for LSAC's copyright, we're not going to print the game here. You'll want to go to your Law Hub account and pull up Prep Test 52. Feel free to pause the video now as you do that. We're going to look at game number one. Now, as you read over the initial paragraph for this game, it's important to think about the basic actions that are involved in LSAT logic games. Essentially, almost every time you're doing one of two things, or possibly both, you're putting things in order or you're putting things in groups. Putting things in order is known as sequencing or ordering or linear games. We'll refer to it as sequencing here. Putting things in groups is typically called grouping, and there are a couple of different ways to do that. So part of your task as you encounter the opening paragraph, kind of the setting the boundaries for the game, so to speak, is to determine what is the fundamental action that you're being called on to do. There are key words and phrases that tell us here that we have before us a sequencing game. It says that each valve is opened exactly once, and it mentions something about no two being opened at the same time. That reference to time is a key giveaway that we're talking about sequencing in this case. One after the other, a left to right diagram to represent it. Now, under the heading of sequencing, there are typically described as two different kinds, loose sequencing and strict sequencing. Those terms are helpful because they describe what's really a continuum between, on the one extreme, kind of not getting anybody locked in, to the other extreme, knowing a lot more specific, narrow, restrictive information. We're starting with the concept of loose sequencing. In many ways, it's the simplest, which is not to be confused with easiest, not necessarily the easiest, but when you have simply elements related to each other as kind of before and after, left and right as they are here, that is loose sequencing and that is an excellent place to begin. By the way, part of the reason we know that is that we, as we look down the rules, every single rule includes either the word before or the word after. Now, in terms of what we're going to call what we're doing here, since these are logic games, I think it's appropriate to refer to the elements that are introduced to us as players. So I'm typically going to return uh, refer to, to what we're placing in a sequence as the elements. In this case, the elements are G, H, I, K, L, N, O, and P. Feel free to write those horizontally on your page instead of vertically if you prefer. I just like verti vertically because it kind of lines up and contrasts with the horizontal orientation we'll have for our rows, I should say our columns, in, in just a moment. By the way, feel free to uh, continue to pause the video as we go and copy down the parts, or you might not need to pause it, but copy down as we go the diagram and the introduction to the way that I'm showing you how this game unfolds, because this video will address the setup and then we'll continue based on that setup in a second video to address the questions. So now that we have the players of the game, we need to address any further boundaries. Is there anything further that we need to know from the paragraph besides the player's identity and what kind of action we're dealing with? We want to look for hidden boundaries, other ways that kind of limit the action somehow. And I've already mentioned that each of these is opened exactly once, it also notes that none of no two are opened at the same time. This is what I like to call a thank goodness boundary because thank goodness there are no ties, there's no complication here, it really is simply eight in a row, one after the other. Now that we know that, 
we're ready to lay out our columns. Okay, now I, I do recommend numbering them at the top and then kind of drawing down, you know, these aren't gonna be perfectly straight, but they probably won't on your scratch work either. So it's a, it's a decent approximation of that. I recommend making fairly deep columns down your scratch work for reasons that will become clear in a moment and then especially as we go on to the questions. All right, but as we do that, we also need to keep in mind that we're going to relate the players to each other. All right, so at the bottom of the page, we also need a web that will relate the befores and the afters, okay? Because there's essentially two tasks that we have that will come out of the rules. I'll address those two tasks in a moment, but for now, think about it this way. It's often approached for logic games that, that when you come to the rules, it's recommended you just kind of go through the rules and diagram each one individually. That can be helpful if you're kind of just getting started but ultimately, an advanced logic games player will immediately begin to combine the rules together. We'll look at it holistically and think, how can I relate the rules in such a way that helps me understand them in relationship to each other? That's where we want to get to eventually for the key process of drawing inferences. Inferences, that is combinations of information from which we draw conclusions are the key to logic game success. So if we can draw our initial diagram in such a way that we enable inferences, why not do that right away? Okay, so given that, we're going to look for a way to link together these rules as we encounter them on the page. One way to do that is to address what I like to call the star player, to identify who that is. Now, it might, be, it might be that there's more than one in many cases, but the star player is the player that's mentioned in multiple rules, ultimately in more rules than any other. As you glance down the rules there, you'll see that that is clearly letter H mentioned in three rules. So what I'm going to do is go under my columns here and just put an H kind of right in the middle of the white space. And then I'm going to begin relating the other players to H with all the rules that mention H. The first rule says that both K and P are before it. Now what we'll do is we'll generally use horizontal lines to indicate sequence but also indefiniteness, meaning we don't know how long the space is. K could be immediately in front of H, or K could be separated from H by many spaces, and the same would be true of P. So we'll begin our diagram this way. Now, the next rule mentions H again. And on this rule, I like to add another very important principle of success on logic games, and that is to slow down. Paradoxically, even though the clock is running and you feel rushed that you need to speed up, you actually need to do precisely the opposite as you're going through the rules. I cannot tell you how often I see a student's entire logic games project on a particular game undone and ruined where they have to start over after five minutes or more because they've misread a rule and fail to discover it until perhaps they get to the questions and are sitting there in utter confusion. I mention that with the second rule because that second rule involves probably more translation than any of the other rules. It says that O is open before L, but after H. So we need to think very carefully about the order here. O then L, but H then O. So what it really is, is H, then O, then L. What's nice about that is that we can immediately link that information with what we already knew. We're not gonna draw H, O, L separately for its own rule because H is already in our web of relationships. 
So it's like a, a bridge that links together the other players. Now, at this point, I'm going to skip to the last rule that mentions H, the fourth one, and put in the information that ensues. We, we learn that N is essentially in the same position relative to H that K and P were. So K, P, and N are all equivalently before H. We don't know how far before. And another crucial point here, we do not know how K, P, and N relate to each other. How does our diagram show that? There are no lines connecting K to P, or P to N, or K to N. We have to follow the lines. We draw them clearly, and then we use only them for our inferences. It's possible to make a mistake by over-inferring and thinking that somehow because something is maybe spatially to the left on your scratch work page, then it must actually be to the left. We'll see a clearer example of this in a moment, but the key point is, make a note, always follow just the lines. Draw them correctly, they will not let you down. Now what about the last two rules that don't mention H? At this point, if you've created this much of a web, it's highly likely that the other rules will mention a player already present, and therefore you can make a link with that player. The third rule tells us that we need to put L after G, G before L, so I'm just gonna kinda spur G off of L like that. G before L, L after G. Now this illustrates very well what I was just mentioning. The only thing we know for sure about G is that it is at, before L. There are no other lines connecting G to anything else. Yeah, let's lengthen that one there. That's bothering me a little bit. Look at G carefully and ask yourself how many players must be before G? I hope you answered zero. None of them must necessarily be before G. And so imagine, and go ahead and you know imagine this visually, imagine G kind of floating to the left so that it's actually to the left of K, P, and N. That is possible. It's not definite because no line indicates that, but it is possible, so we need to be careful not to over-restrict G in terms of where it could be located. Now the last rule provides kind of a mirror image to what we just did. A mirror image to the GL relationship is the KI relationship, I after K. Just like G could quite possibly focus, uh, excuse me, float all the way to the front, I, it is very possible, could float all the way to the back, that is to the far right of the diagram. Imagine I doing that, and you'll make sure not to avoid some possibilities for I that will become relevant and very important later. Now, notice what we have at this point. Eight players on the left of the screen, eight players in our web related to each other. No one's left out, and we don't have any of what are often called floaters or free agents, that is players that don't have any rules about them. You will see that with other games, but we don't have it here. Everybody has some limitation, and that's great news. Now, one other thing that you want to do as part of your setup. We made our web. There's another important kind of inference that you want to draw before going to the questions, and it's called the first last inference. If there are very limited number of players that could be either first or last, it's important to infer that early on. The reason we're focusing on first and last, spot number one and spot number eight, is that they're more limited than the spots in the middle, because they're on the end. You can't go further right than eight, and you can't go further left than one. So let's ask the question, for spot number one, who could possibly be there? Think about that for a moment. I hope you recognize that K 
P and N are all possibilities because they are sitting there on the left side of our web of relationships. But there's one more that's a little subtle, pointed to this fact earlier, but G could also be first. All the other players, I, H, O, and L, have lines in front of them, connecting them to players in front of them. None of them could be first. Now that's four players who could be first. I'm agnostic about whether you write that down. If you want to write G, K, P, or N, kind of above column number one, that's great. Feel free to do that. Some students like to write more than others. But where I'm not agnostic, where I'm certain and have conviction, is that spot number eight should be written down in this case because it's more limited. Our web shows us that L could be there, but don't forget about I. I is free to float to the far right, and for that reason, either I or L could be in spot number eight. They are the only ones who can. That kind of restriction is going to be an inference that will almost certainly pay off. And we're going to see it pay off in multiple questions when we go over the questions for this game. So in sum, as you set up the game with its players, with its boundaries, with its core action, if it's loose sequencing, relate the players to each other in a web using the star player to help you, and then look at the first and last position and what limitations apply there. In the next video, we'll run through the questions and see how this method richly pays off as we seek to apply it. Mm -hmm.